This episode of Get Out of Here, the AP Travel Podcast, is sponsored by Carnival Corporation, the world's largest cruise company with 10 of the world's leading brands, including Carnival Cruise Line, Cunard, Holland America Line, Princess Cruises, and Seaborn. To learn about the world's leading cruise lines from Carnival Corporation and great vacation options, contact your travel professional or visit worldsleadingcruiselines.com. It's Get Out of Here. I'm Warren Levinson. A few years ago, I was at a bicycle expo in Manhattan. Now, if you know me at all, you know that I'll sneak a bicycling reference into pretty much every topic of conversation, so why not get that out of the way up front? I, I saw one booth where they were hawking breathing masks and asserting, one day you will no sooner go out on your bike without one of these than without a helmet. Well, that seemed a little extreme, and I'm still not wearing a breathing mask. But the real surprise came when I asked, where did the idea come from? Bali came in response. An Indonesian island paradise with an air pollution problem? Turns out it's not alone. We're taking a little different tack with this show. Oh, we're, we're traveling, but the travel we'll be talking about is Beth Gardner's Air Pollution World Tour. Beth is a former AP correspondent in New York and London, and she's written a new book on the subject called Choked, Life and Breath in the Age of Air Pollution. Her air pollution world tour took her from London to Los Angeles, from Krakow to Delhi to Berlin, where local authorities are attempting to dial back a reliance on private cars with some encouraging results. And she's here to talk about the book and about her trip. Beth Gardner, let's start with what what's the germ of this book? Where does it come from? What led you to look at the effect that air pollution has on all of us? Well, it really sprang out of my own personal experience living in London, actually. Um, not fortunately personal experience in the sense of having had any, any health problems caused by air pollution myself or in my family, but in the sense of sort of gradually coming to realize that this was a really serious problem actually in London, it's much wider than that. Europe as a whole has a, has a, a real um, significant air quality problem. Uh, but for a long time, it seemed to be something that no one ever talked about. Um, so I, I lived in New York before. I moved to London almost 19 years ago. And from the beginning, I was always bothered by um, this sort of really kind of awful smell and a, and a thickness to the air that you could almost taste when I walked out on the street in London. And I had never noticed that in New York, even though it is obviously also a really big city with lots of cars and traffic. But it didn't seem to be something that anyone really ever talked about. So I kind of pushed it to the back of my mind and, and stopped thinking of it as anything other than an annoyance. Um, until many years later, when I happened to be working on a story to, that was to do with the, the 2012 Olympics coming to London, um, and the, the uh, subject of the article was to do with uh, the air quality and how it would affect the athletes. And it really didn't take me more than sort of five minutes of Googling as I was researching that piece for my jaw really to drop because what I saw um, was that the, the science of air pollution and, and what it does to us is very powerful. And so are the effects of pollution on our bodies. And, um, you know, it's linked not only to sort of asthma and breathing problems, which I think I would have been pretty ready to believe, but also to just a you know really shocking range of other problems, right up to and including the biggest health problem of all, premature death rates go up when pollution goes up. So as I began to learn that, it obviously bothered me as someone who lives in London, as a parent of a then pretty young child. Um, but as a journalist, it also really struck me as a as a big story because I started to wonder why this wasn't something that I was reading more about and why it wasn't something that people were talking more about. So that wasn't exactly when I started working on this book, but I think that was when the idea sort of began to grow in my mind. And once I did start, you know, delving into it a little bit more deeply, I realized obviously that this is not a problem that is just confined to London. Um, you know, it's a, it's a global problem. Um, there's a, a statistic from the World Health Organization that, that says that more than 90% of people on earth breathe air that's unhealthy. So eventually I sort of started following the story where it led and it, and it took me around the world. I went to China and India and Poland. I spent a lot of time in, in the US, particularly California, 
kind of trying to tie together all the pieces of this, the strands of this story. And that's where it becomes, for, at least for our purposes, a travel story. So, yeah. um, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's a harrowing chapter in Delhi. Uh, and talk to me about, you know, you didn't go to Delhi to look at the things that people go to look at when they go to India. You went to basically look at the air. Yeah, exactly. So I was a, I was a weird sort of tourist um, in Delhi. You know, I, I did certainly love and enjoy. It was actually a, a, a wonderful trip, despite the fact that I was there researching um you know, this menace that's killing more than a million and a half Indian people every year. Um, Delhi's an, an extraordinary city. Um, you know, India is an extraordinary country. But there is a, you know, a really um, important failure going on in, in terms of government and infrastructure and regulation and other things that have allowed air pollution to, to just become this, this horrific threat to people's health and, and their lives. Um, <clears throat> And, um, you know, I, I really framed Delhi in the book and, and India as a whole, because it, Delhi is just sort of a, the window through which I looked at a you know, wider regional problem. It's all of South Asia, Pakistan and Bangladesh as well. Um, you know, I, I framed it in the book as sort of the, the global ground zero for air pollution. India has, I think, 10 of the, the top 15 cities or something like that on the World Health Organization ranking of the most polluted. Um, you know, so it's absolutely horrendous. I happened to visit there in the spring, which is a, a less polluted time of year. Their, their worst pollution comes in the autumn when farmers outside the city set fire to their fields after harvest and these huge, thick clouds of smoke, which are so heavy that NASA photographs them from space. They just drift and they sit over the city and, and they, you know, cause the pollution to get so bad that, um, you know, drivers can are getting into car accidents because the visibility is so poor on the roads and flights are disrupted. And, you know, more importantly, many thousands of people, many of them children, you know, are, are in the hospital. But even in the springtime when it when it was cleaner, but not clean, you know, you could sort of see the the smoke, the pollution shimmering in the, you know, the headlights and the street lights at night and during the daytime kind of hanging like this shroud over buildings and, you know, people people really feel the effects. Um, nearly all Indians have someone in their family, someone they know or love who's been affected by whether it's respiratory disease or heart problems or, or other ailments that are very clearly connected to air pollution. So it's a huge you know, public health crisis for all of India. And it's something that you can really feel and, and see you know, just in, in everyday life there. The air in New York is, uh, well, it's the air of a big city, but 40 years after the Clean Air Act, it's better than it was. Is there a constituency? Is there a kind of clean air constituency in India? Um, well, the, there actually it's, is a really positive story to tell. Um, and, you know, in, in some ways, I ended up putting the U.S. And, and New York in the sort of positive half of the book of places that are, are achieving progress. And, and it all really comes back to the Clean Air Act of 1970, which to my mind, I devoted a whole chapter to it, is really one of the most consequential laws in modern American history. And it saved, you know, according to EPA analyses, literally millions of American lives and trillions of dollars in almost 50 years since it was enacted. Um, and the, the reason for that, I think, was twofold. It's partly to do with the, the very powerful ways in which the law was designed. It's a real innovative piece of legislation that had a lot of new sort of approaches to regulation that, that enabled it to be very effective. And the, the second part of that is the, the power of the EPA in enforcing it. You know, certainly not a perfect agency by any stretch, but the EPA has really, you know, done a, a pretty good job, a pretty effective job of enforcing the laws, whereas, uh, you know, across the pond over in Europe, they, they've got lots of nice clean air, you know, laws and regulations on their books, but they don't really have an equivalent, um, equivalently effective or, or empowered or centralized enforcer. So there's a, you know, a lot of cheating by the car companies and, and a real failure to sort of turn those rules and laws into reality on the ground. 
Um, but I think, you know, you asked whether there's still a, a clean air constitui- constituency in New York and in the U.S. more widely. Well, actually, what I'm, what I'm asking is, I'm, yeah. I'm, we'll get to that, but I'm asking, is there a clean air constituency in, in India or, for that matter, in China, in Poland? Well, China's a different deal because India is, is a democracy where presumably the people have a say. Um, so China's a separate issue. But is there a clean air constituency as well in India? Um, you know, it's still, I think, sort of an emerging um, issue in terms of people's awareness. I think there has started to be a constituency in the sort of more educated, um, you know, urban middle classes who understand much more now than they did even, I think, five years ago, how powerfully the the air is affecting them. Um, But I I think there's still a long way to go. You know, there's more news coverage now than there used to be, but it does not seem to have really, you know, emerged and developed to the extent where the government actually has felt the need to, to take steps towards doing something about it. And that is a contrast with China, which, as you say, obviously is not a, a democracy where people can express their, their will through the vote. But nonetheless, the government is quite attuned to, you know, when an issue may be reaching a point where it, it's going to threaten stability because the public is angry about it or it's going to somehow undermine, you know, the Communist Party's grip on power. And I think that has happened in China to some extent over the last probably eight or 10 years. And it's why we've seen the Chinese government, I think, actually start to take some some real concrete steps that have delivered, you know, very measurable improvements in air quality in big cities like Beijing. Obviously, they still have a really serious problem and there's a long way to go. But, you know, this saves lives because what we know about air pollution and cleaning the air is that, you know, even incremental improvements literally translate into, you know, lives saved and and health spared. So that's been the story playing out in China. But India, unfortunately, is, you know, not really there yet, I would say, in terms of awareness and political pressure. Does your research in this um, make you sensitive everywhere you go, everywhere you travel, that I must be breathing in something that could be shortening my life? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I certainly am really aware of it, but um, it's funny, a friend of mine in, in London who hadn't really known that much about air pollution read my book and said that now, you know, she can hardly walk on the street without thinking about it. And she asked me if it was like that for me. But I think in some ways it's kind of been the opposite, um, actually. My trajectory has gone the other way. I wrote this book because I, I was kind of obsessed with it in London. And when I walked out on the street and I could smell it, you know, once I sort of reached that point of, of having done enough research to really understand it, it was something that bothered me all the time. And I think in some sense now I feel like, I don't know, maybe the book has gotten it out of my system a little bit. I've written it. <laughs> I've kind of done my my part, you know. This is what I could do. I'm, I'm a journalist. Like, I, I, covered, a, I covered the story. Um, I gave it the attention that I thought it needed. And in a way, I think, you know, not on a totally conscious level, but on, in some ways, I think now I kind of feel like, well, you know, let the chips fall where they may. You've got to live in, in the world as it is. Beth Gardner is a London-based freelance writer, a former longtime AP correspondent, author of the book Choked, about uh, the effects of air pollution on everybody's health. She's traveled the world in search of the problem and potential solutions. After a break, we'll talk about her travels and travel tips. This is Get Out of Here, the AP Travel Podcast. Download the AP News app for the latest in news, sports, travel, entertainment, and more. Available now for iPhone and iPad. It's Get Out of Here, back to our conversation with Beth Gardner, author of the book Choked. So, Beth, do you now travel with uh, breathing masks? Um, Not not generally. Um, It depends where I go. I did buy one when I went to China. Um, And I also, um, earlier this year, it's not in the book, but I I made a trip to Mongolia, which was for a, a separate article, but also about air pollution. That is also a horrendously polluted place, and I I did wear a mask when I was there. Um, But in in my everyday life, certainly not. I mean, in London, you see people who ride, you know, who commute by bike, and they they spend time sitting in in traffic on their bikes. You see those people wear um, uh, pollution masks, but I I don't wear them at home. I'm not really a big biker. Um, But generally speaking, no. But I mean, I think this is something that's that's coming to people's attention more that people think about when they travel. 
And, you know, in the U.S., it's it's become, you know, particularly an issue um, in an acute way in a lot of parts of the Western United States where, you know, we've been seeing because of climate change, wildfires getting more common, more frequent, more intense. And people living in cities like, you know, San Francisco, Seattle, um, all the way up and down the West Coast, including Canada, you know, really suffering sometimes through these episodes where the the smoke just sits over the city. And I, I've been in San Francisco when, when that's happened and it's awful, um, you know, and the pollution rates go up to, you know, levels like what they are in Beijing. So you, I have seen, you know, Americans in American cities wearing pollution masks. The first time I saw one, I was actually at a bike expo in New York, and um, basically there was a booth where they were selling these particular masks, or at least showing these particular masks. And I said, S and, and they just looked at and said, this is the future of bicycling in cities. Everybody one day is going to be wearing this. You know how everybody wears helmets where years ago nobody wore helmets? We think this is the next big thing. And I asked, well, where did you come up with this idea? Or where did you first see this? They said, Bali. And I oh, thought, that's interesting. That's interesting. Um, Tropical well, Southeast, Paradise Bali? Yeah, Southeast Asia is also a, a problem, a, you know, place that has a, a problem with air quality. And generally speaking, in developing countries, it's not true everywhere. But as a rule of thumb, you know, there tends to be um, less stringent regulation on on engine and fuel quality. So that means that when you walk down a street in in, you know, a, a country like Indonesia, you're likely to have a lot more, um, you know, exhaust just sort of coming into your face at levels where you can, you know, feel and smell it um, as compared to the U.S. where I would say generally that only happens when you have sort of like a big diesel truck or something like that go by. Um, but, you know, the thing with these masks, especially for bike, bicyclists, because when you're exercising, you're, you're obviously breathing harder. Um, so you're more vulnerable to pollution because you're taking in more air under those circumstances. But it can also get uncomfortable to wear a mask, you know, when you're really breathing hard. And even if you're not breathing hard, when I wore it in China, I ended up taking it off half the time because it was sort of squishing my nose and it was a little bit uncomfortable to wear. Um, and, you yeah, know, I'm a big I, I sweaty at, guy. When I ride, I can't imagine wearing more than I already am, which isn't that yeah. much. Yeah. And the other thing is, I, I looked at some of the research recently and interviewed some scientists about how effective these masks are. And a lot of them work really well when they're tested in the lab. But what, what they've found is that under real world conditions, um, you know, you're moving around and particularly if you're, you're biking or running. Um, you know, there's a lot of shifting that goes on. And if the mask is not in completely the right position and the seal breaks on the side and you've got air coming in, you know, next to your nose or along your cheek or whatever, you're losing a lot of the benefit. So it's kind of questionable. But, you know, one thing I, I was told by some of these, um, you know, experts who I interviewed on, on this question is that, a, a, you know, another thing you can do if you're biking or you're walking or you're traveling is to um, you know think a little bit about your route and see if there's a way that you can bike or walk that's not along a busy road because it really does make a big difference even if you can go on like a quieter street that's like one block over you know and runs parallel to a, a really trafficy road you could cut your pollution exposure by half so that's worth thinking about too. Oh wow, quieter streets, uh, less pollution, less uh, exposure to uh, to toxins. So in general, though, uh, overall. Where's the air good? If you're look, looking for a place to travel to, and this is on your list of uh, qualities in a place you want to go, where would you go for good air? Well, you know, I think there's places like sort of northern Canada or Scandinavia, if you go to sort of the more remote parts where, where the air is great. Although, having said that, um, you know, <laughs> there's a big problem in rural areas of wood burning, um, you know, people with fireplaces or, or log burners in their homes that is actually a, a you know really significant health threat as well. Um, there's no place that's perfect is the answer. Um, and you know I think the reason for that is because what what I saw uh, you know as I travel around, around the world is that this really kind of comes down to fossil fuels. Um, and fossil fuels are the the foundation that we've built our modern world on. And there's very few places that are you know if any that are are not dependent on them. Um, you know, so there are cities that are better, better or worse, you know, rural areas that might be a little bit cleaner. Um, but generally speaking, there's there's no place, you know, that's great and there's no place that's perfect. Um, 
the U.S. as a whole has has done pretty well over the years. Um, but you know we're in danger of going backwards now, partly because climate change makes it harder to keep the air clean. The hot weather combines with the pollution to um, you know make it even worse. We're seeing rollbacks in in Washington now that that also threaten to push us backwards. So there's there's no place that's perfect, but um, you know I think it's also worth keeping in perspective if you're a traveler and you're just going somewhere for a couple of weeks. You know that's different to you know somebody who lives in you know Beijing or or Delhi or another really polluted city because there there can be sort of immediate short term effects. We know that you know heart attacks and strokes and emergency room admissions go up on polluted days, but the the more the the, the the bigger effects are, you know, over a lifetime. What what's the impact on you if you breathe, you know, day in and day out over years of your life? So if you're just traveling, you're going on vacation to China or something. I mean, sure, bring a mask, but I, you know, I don't think it's something that's gonna, you know, be be life ruining. Um, exactly. It may it may be something that you you know feel uncomfortable if you have asthma, you know, you you suffer a little bit. But um, generally speaking, it's the, it's the longer term exposure that does real damage. Right. Go see the sites anyway. Beth Gardner, thank you very much. I really appreciate your taking the time. It's been great talking to you, Warren. Beth Gardner is a former AP correspondent in New York and London and the author of Choked, Life and Breath in the Age of Air Pollution, just out from the University of Chicago Press. And now, my favorite trip. Someone told me, you show up. For the people who matter the most to you. London's a little more than diesel-fouled air. A TV version of the Richard Curtis movie Four Weddings and a Funeral is playing now on Hulu, and Rebecca Rittenhouse is in the cast. She lived in London for the six months of filming, and it turns out to have been a pretty sweet perk, as she told our entertainment writer Alicia Rancilio recently. You had to move to London for filming. I did. It was terrible. It was just so hard to live in Notting Hill in my beautiful flat. It was just... Man, I hated it. <laughs> and how long, about how long were you there? Six months. Wow. Yeah, I went full Richard Curtis universe. I had my florist, I had my butcher, all these little specialty shops, the cheese shop, the wine shop. It was perfect. Perfect. I was two blocks from Portobello Road. I miss it. Would you say, do you know your way around well now? And... Pretty well, but London is surprisingly large. I thought that I was going to, I mean, you can walk around your neighborhood and then the neighborhoods around it, but more than that, I mean, it, it would take me like an hour to walk to Mayfair, which is central London. It's just so much bigger and more spread out than I thought. There's still a lot of exploring to do. I'm hoping to get another job in London so I can go back, maybe stay in a different neighborhood. Yeah. <laughs> Did you? Do you have, like, a favorite area? You, I mean, obviously you were in Notting Hill, which is... Yeah, I I did love Notting Hill, but um, my friend Zoe Boyle, who is also in the show, she plays Gemma, lives in East London in Shoreditch, which is super cool and hip, and that's an area I would be interested in exploring as well. Rebecca Rittenhouse plays Ainsley Howard in Mindy Kaling's new TV version of Four Weddings and a Funeral. <laughs> And that's the show. Get Out of Here is a production of the Associated Press, produced under the supervision of Nikesa Moody and Peter Costanzo. We'll see you next time. This episode of Get Out of Here, the AP Travel Podcast, was sponsored by Carnival Corporation, the world's largest cruise company with 10 of the world's leading brands, including Carnival Cruise Line, Cunard, Holland America Line, Princess Cruises, and Seabourn. To learn about the world's leading cruise lines from Carnival Corporation and great vacation options, contact your travel professional or visit worldsleadingcruiselines.com.